Hello everybody. Um, what I want to do for this uh, first presentation in this afternoon slot, while you all doze gently, uh, enjoying the sandwiches, slowly uh, digesting in your stomachs, is to um, re reflect on the landscape context. And I hope to do that. It was a task set for me, and I, I feel very uh, privileged to be invited and thank the organisers for inviting me, and also to thank um, um, them for sharing their research ahead of time to give me a bit of a glimpse, a head start on thinking about what they've been doing. Um, we're all here to celebrate this magnificent achievement of the publication within only 10 years of this important Stafford Hoard monograph. And um, we've heard a lot about the hoard so far in its context. I, I'm not saying this is preliminary uh, ideas for you, just as a cop out, cop out to deflect criticism, uh, it, but really to sincerely say these are I'm going to push some ideas out there for potential future research or not, <laughs> depending on how it goes. So, <laughs> equal, um, so this is an opportunity to think about um, the hoard in a landscape context and. and the first thing I have to tell you, I, I think is very important, is to say, as Chris Fern does on page 24 of the new monograph, the context is problematic. In fact, one could go so far as to say there is no archaeological context for a Staffordshire hoard that was found in the plough soil. And if you want to be absolutely stark about it, there's no clue of how it entered that field before July 2009. And already a few people have in press just played with the idea, you know, at early stages, and I admit I'm not holding them to it now, but, you know, the idea that it could have been, you know, a 9th, 10th century deposit, and indeed uh, Ray and Batty have suggested a, 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 a kingdom, an often, an often a late 8th century Mercian context for this kind of uh, deposit. I'm not going to suggest that as an orthodoxy, but it makes the point clearly that we still don't really, we can't pin down how it got to that field before 2009. The field work was very limited, and this is not exceptional, this is typical for this kind of discovery. There's no real broader context identified for the Horde, even within its own field. Um, and there has been no wider landscape analysis since Delahook's important, valuable 2011 contribution. Um, and that was from a sort of landscape history perspective and not an archaeological one. Now, the 2019 monograph, um, which we, we all hope to read and uh, acquire and read uh, very soon, is a phenomenal achievement. It contains an important basis for a landscape analysis, but given the nature and structure of the research, um, the, the, the commentary on the landscape is fragmented across multiple chapters, including contributions and, and thoughts by a range of the, of the authors. I'm sure that's not a, a, an exhaustive list of those that uh, uh, address the issue of the landscape context at different points within the monograph. So I'm saying there's a lot that we need a, a broader landscape approach, and there are multiple ways forward for doing that, I feel, that still have to be done. And I'd like to present uh, five ways that foreground the issue of memory and the hoard. Um, and the first one is to suggest we need to look at the hoard as its own landscape, sort of encoding memories of spatial and material transformations, very much building on what we've heard already. Um, think about the significance of the place and uh, the issue of consignment and memory. And there's still options for how we interpret that act of depositing the hoard. Then we can look out to the broader landscape, and there's many themes we could address here, but I've picked on movement, surveillance, and power, because I think that links very much to my, what I'm doing at the moment, thinking about other Mercian uh, archaeology in, in, in further west. Um, uh, <coughs> yes, and I think we need to think beyond the Anglo-Saxon and the Mercian labels to think about a frontier landscape, and indeed perhaps um, um, and, and west I'm thinking here again. And, as already been discussed, the need for more comparative landscape analysis. Yes, the Staffordshire Hoard is unique and exceptional, but can we put it into a comparative perspective, looking at other deposits and, and, and finds? So, just to start us off, we have this field, and we have right next to Watling Street, and a field where we still haven't had a full extensive excavation, investigation of that field, let alone surrounding fields. But we can think of the hoard as a landscape. It embodies various spatially located activities. We don't know where they were made, but we can think about the relationship in this biography of individual objects and the different elements composing it. It's making, it's exchanging. 
This was a horde that was always on the move, as parts of other objects that, that were once were, um, and perhaps also as fragments. They're wearing and wielding. They're displaying and curating. The surfaces that they create with the uh, dynamic art um, could be another kind of landscape we could think about, um, and the skins that, that, um, that would have been covered by them. Uh, the assembling and fragmenting, could, I, I would like to emphasise, has to be thought about as, as in terms of spatial arrangements, in terms of how, this, how it was assembled and how it may have been pro publicly or not fragmented, broken up. What, it was, it, other bits of these objects went elsewhere, the blades most certainly of the, of the daggers and swords. The storing or displaying as fragments and then the depositing. Now that's areas we've already seen addressed, so I won't dwell on that any further. Although I would completely chime with what Karen's paper uh, delivered by John this morning was saying, was about we need to set up more robust models for thinking about how those spatial arrangements may have taken place during the life histories of objects. Obviously we can't pin it down exactly, but I think we, we can do more work there to, to set up possible scenarios that we can then think through and think of different explanations for the significance of these objects, linking to what Tani was talking about, the importance of mobile wealth and exchange items in this, this, this um, warrior elite culture, and be, as Franz was saying, perhaps also going beyond the elite more. Second point, the significance of place. Now here we really are even struggling with this first stage, aren't we? Um, because we don't have a mound, or we do have a mound, uh, we don't really have, do we have a, a one deposit or multiple deposits over time? The um, intriguing possibility of two bits of horse harness, which evoked that opening image from the Potteries exhibition, showing a rider on a horse with all the gear on him, or you know, just evoking the idea of, of, of a rider in the field. Do we have multiple <laughs> deposits within this site? So do we know this was a, a one-off place? Um, chosen randomly or for convenience for deposition or, or are we looking at some place that maybe temporary activities are happening regularly but we just can't see them the exception being the, the one deposit which is leaving a trace because it's made of such obviously recognizable material it's a mound or is it you know is, do we really have an archaeology of, a, of, a, of an ancient feature a temporary feature a, a natural knoll that may have been perceived as an ancient monument in the early, uh, early medieval period. So we, we still really don't know whether we're looking at a place that had significance or a place that was significant because it wasn't significant, if that makes sense. A place that was, you know, not a, a familiar place, but was well accessible and well known. We have the landscape of movement, surveillance and power, and I think uh, uh, John and Sam may be addressing some of these issues in, in, as follow-up papers, but I, I do want to just make the point that uh, Delahook does take us on a very important journey, I think, as does the monograph, thinking about the clear, stark distribution of finds, the contrast west and east, or south and west, where we have hardly anything in this more marginal landscape, and the distribution of finds uh, um, of, of Roman medieval dates towards uh, Letticetum, 3.5 kilometres to the east, the, the small um, um, settlement, Roman settlement of Wall, and of course Litchfield. So we potentially have a site that may seem marginal, but it's on the key routes. It may be a site where you may want to set up a watchtower, where you may assemble, where you can see people approaching. There's all sorts of potentials for thinking about this marginal location in terms of surveillance of movement into and out of a core district um, for the Mercian Kingdom. And we can see that better on this is again from uh, uh, Della Hook and Leahy's work and others. Um, the mapping, can it chase and ugly hay? These, these areas are later known as sort of woodland and open woodland, uh, important resources but marginal land for settlement. <coughs> and also other features, including this enigmatic Naves Castle on Watling Street, which has been, at least by some, seen as potentially a Roman signal station. Uh, just to take you quickly through some of Della Hook's other mapping, to, to, from a later back projection, we can consider perhaps this a marginal location, but on key routes and a key place you'd be aware of and pass by. Hence my point about significant by not being significant, not a place you'd necessarily inhabit or dwell at, but you'd always be passing by. Motorway services, but fewer Starbucks. <laughs> so, you know, and again, this idea that it's on the edge of something else. And I think that's very interesting. And here, Tanya was mentioning this earlier, this is Della's map of reconstructed roads 
to make the point, well, Della makes the point that it's almost like in a no man's land island, you have a triangle of roads, and that may be interesting in itself. That, you know, it's somewhere where you can't really go without being observed, uh, and yet um, no one's really perhaps dwelling there for long. I, I, can't, I can't, be, can't be any more precise than that, and these are only, these, I, I don't think I'm anywhere further ahead than anyone else with this, or further behind, in, in the sense that we're looking at that sense of marginality and yet connectedness, if that's a, a, a useful. Uh. And here, Horowitz argues that Naves Castle um, may be a signal station, and we have the Hammerwich name, which uh, David Parsons and, and, and Della as well have discussed in relation to the Horde site as a potential, at some point in the early Middle Ages, a settlement connected to metal working, perhaps. My fourth point, <laughs> I've jumped quite quickly here, but I want to get on with this, um, frontier landscapes, and this is where I think, I think we really are struggling a little bit more. Yes, we're close to a mercy and heartland, but we're really still struggling here, and this is from, um, I think it's John's section of the, the monograph here, we're still really struggling to connect it into what we traditionally call Anglo-Saxon burial and, and artefact um, uh, uh, traces. So here we have the Trent Valley, here we have uh, Repton, yeah? and here we have Litchfield. So we're not far away from areas where we have 5th to 7th century furnished burial rites, whatever that may mean, and we're not far away from the but basic evidence of barrow digging in the 19th century, of Bateman's excavations and others in the Peak District. And yet we're not, emphatically not, in that area where we have those traces in, in the immediate vicinity. We have the idea there may be two early tribal groupings or, uh, 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 you know, on either side of the Watling Street going over Cannock Chase and this upland spread of the Midlands. But we are, in a, really, I would suggest, we actually need to think about this much in a much broader landscape <coughs> of frontier. If we, again, I think this is discussed in, in John Hines' section of the monograph, you know, that his, his dated, demonstrably dated 7th century weapon burials makes very clear to us that the Staffordshire Horde is not proximal to this kind of activity um, if it is being deposited in the late 7th century. And Kevin Leahy has done a lot of work on this as well in his 2015 paper, making the point here, I feel, that we're not at the heart of distributions of, of other war gear finds from the early Middle Anglo-Saxon periods. We are on that western edge, and indeed the monograph maps themselves make this absolutely crystal clear. The, dark, uh, the shaded area is crudely the area of furnished burial um, in the 5th to 7th centuries. We can quibble about that in many different ways. I'm sure many of these people in this room have expertise in this. But the, the crude point is, is there, isn't it? The, the Staffordshire Horde is just west of this line. And we can replicate that again and again in distribution maps of different material. This is from John Blair's uh, fascinating and uh, brand new, or still for me, brand new book, um, looking at Middle Anglo-Saxon settlement finds and, 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 and uh, settlements and finds, stray finds. And again, making the point that the, the Staffordshire Horde is at the very west of this density of known material culture. And if uh, this thanks to Peter Reevil of the PAS, again makes the point from this from Shatter finds, I know it's a bit later, but you know we can call this um, contemporary or, or near contemporary, or perhaps not so near contemporary, but you know slightly later. But making the point that this zone is a real threshold, okay? And I know that in the popular engagement maps we've created for Mercia, for, for uh, Roger Brown and Kevin in his book, we do Mercia as the big square, and that's late eighth century Mercia, maybe. But in this period, I think frankly we have to see this is the frontier, not. The, the, the big square that links the Dee, the Wash, the Thames, and the Severn. And I think that's really important that we remember that point. And again, from John Blair's work, uh, a mapping here, um, this, this sort of frequent settlement archaeology zone and, and Staffordshire Horde to the west of it. Okay? And if we look at it in terms of battles from the 7th century, again, I'm stealing all the maps and all the images from the monograph, uh, you, we, we can understand it in terms of a frontier that's mer about mercy and engagements to the northwest and east, and, and not as a heartland of Mercia in, in a sense. And this makes me jump to this broader comparative landscape context, because I do feel that the, the dikes of which I'm most obsessed with at the moment, the Watts Dyke and, and Hoffers Dyke, are very much seen as borders of Mercia, 
and they shut down our thinking about this broader westerly Mercian zone from the 6th and 7th century onwards. I'd like to point out three, uh, well, I'm going to talk about a number of different sites on this western side that perhaps might provide parallels. So the Dinan, Dinan Pommel comes from uh, a, a find from the, the, the river crossing. Um, this is from uh, uh, Ludlow. And I want to make the point that while this is obviously only a single pommel find, it's nowhere near the scale. It's broadly contemporaneous in style and form to some of the pommels from the Staffordshire Ford. And here we find it at a key location, a key uh, river team uh, crossing place deposited in a watery context. Another one that uh, Mark Redknapp uh, mentioned earlier in, in discussions is the Gresford pommel. This is a pre-conservation uh, top left and then I think a, a nicer photograph bottom right. Different sides of this mo um, object and this is another pommel, broadly contemporaneous uh, styles to those found in the Staffordshire Hoard and it's found in Gresford. Now we don't have an exact fine spot so I'm making it up a bit here but I want to make the point that Gresford is hardly an arbitrary location and as Mark has already said today, this is in the frontier zone as it is to become. So here we have Watts Dyke, which on current thinking is early 9th century successor to Offers Dyke. Offers Dyke runs about here. Um, and you've got an Iron Age Hill Fort, a Bryn Allen, and Gresford Village is here. Now I don't know, I put a massive great star here because I don't know. But this is where the Allen River changes course in a significant shift, leading out of the Welsh uplands into the Cheshire Plain. So whatever's going on in this area, there's evidence of a Roman shrine at Gresford, there's evidence of this is, this is a threshold location that has parallels with the Staffordshire Horde. So we have a fording site uh, for one pommel at, at, at Dinham and uh, by a later, later, later settlement. And we have Gresford, it's hardly an arbitrary location where this single pommel was found. Now I'm not saying we can jump from this to a pattern, uh, that's just a picture of what site to give you a flavour of what it looks like. Um, big linear earthwork. We can't jump to a pattern from this, but I do think we have to consider that the dikes may be being put at locations that are already very familiar to the Mercians, their Welsh rivals and almost everybody else, moving their armies and their trading activities through this landscape. And here's a third one for you. This is Chantisilio Paris. This is right by the River Severn, the River Vanwy. Um, I, I bring it up here because it may be very well known to you from readers of medieval archaeology, but perhaps less well known from the fact that Cotswold archaeology expanded on the excavations by Clued Powers Archaeological Trust and in the Archaeological Journal a couple of years ago published a huge ceremonial landscape of the Neolithic and Bronze Age. The earlier CPAT excavations found an early medieval cemetery, and where the green star is, at the top end of the burial mound, they found two early medieval spearheads. Um, now, Again, I'm hardly saying this is parallel activity, but again, you've got the deposits of weaponry in, a, in, a, in, a ancient, in an ancient burial mound context. And the point I want to flip back to is that this is right next to Offa's Dyke. So if Offa's Dyke is late 8th century, and that's a bit, that is still an if, um, we have the ceremonial landscape where people are doing things, burying the dead, depositing weapons in the 6th, 7th century or thereabouts. My point is, this isn't a parallel for the Staffordshire Horde, but it does suggest a broader framework of activity of a mobile Western Mercian frontier zone with various British kingdoms in which these locations, at key routes through the landscape, the observable thresholds next to major rivers, may have been sites where activities of a ceremonial or ritual nature are taking place. That's as far as I can go. So we're part of an evolving frontier network and zone. And let's jump forward to make a couple of extra points to conclude. Thinking about the Pillar of Elise, this 9th century uh, fragment of a cross, uh, which I was involved with Nancy Edwards and Gary Robinson at Bangor in excavating and conclusively demonstrating, is sitting on top of an early Bronze Age burial mound, just to the um, west of the modern town of Llangothland, in the, in, uh, a side shoot from the, vale, um, the, the Dee Valley the vale, in the Vale of Llangothland. Now, this early 9th century monument has uh, the most monumental survi surviving Latin text, um, longest Latin text on any monument. You can hardly see it now, uh, but when transcribed in the late 17th century, it reveals a, a, a text written by, uh, 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 commissioned by Cungan, King of Powys, to honour his great granddaddy, uh, Elise, or Elise, um, to evoke military victories and battles. 
uh, past and perhaps victory is present and hoped for. Now this is hardly a weapon, uh, but it is, it is a propagandistic, monumental weapon in a sense, possibly at an assembly site, possibly at a muster site for armies and evoking military victories. And one does happen to, can't help but reflect on the possibilities that could the Staffordshire Horde be a very different material manifestation of similar conceptions, ideas. Ancient mounds on prominent routes deployed to mobilise identities and memories. And indeed, while we don't know exactly how it would have looked like, here's Aaron Watson's visualisation of what the mound, the ancient mound raised with a new fresh cross may have looked like. We have to see this as erected to celebrate martial victories past and present in a pro prominent landscape location, perhaps the site of assembly or as Nancy Edwards says, a royal inauguration site. And what's important, I think, to flag up here, there's a kind of landscape analysis I did with Patricia Morietta Flores, uh, now of Lancaster University, but formerly of my department, where we looked at the broad, broader least cost pathways of this location and suggested it had a key relationship, a key node, it was a key node in movement through this landscape that may have been had a symbolic and economic importance for the, the Powysian dynasty. I can't go into all of that here, but here's our least cost pathways, which actually showed that right, if you're going west east up the Vale of Llangollen, you're more likely to pass by the Pillar of Elizeg than follow the river. And I think that's an important uh, spatial analysis project we did to, to reveal new aspects of, a, of the landscape that you can't see on the ground. So it's part of this. So what I'm suggesting is that these, the site of the Pillar of Elise, with the red dot, a star, sorry, is part of a landscape contested through the seventh, eighth, ninth century, and is a much later, by two centuries in this case, in the Staffordshire Horde, but maybe utilising the landscape in a way that there are parallels with the Horde. The final site I want to talk about is uh, later still, uh, 10th, 11th century, and a cross at Minor Quiver. In Whitford and Flintshire. This has been um, surveyed around it by David Griffiths of Oxford University, analysed by Nancy Edwards. My comments on this evocative 10th or early 11th century freestanding cross are that it's another monument that deploys weaponry. It deploys weaponry in the figures, the martial figures, as a, 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 a warrior or a weapon individual on the side, the south side, and this um, individual with a spear, an axe, uh, a, a, a sword or a very long other appendage between his legs um, in the middle of the, the, the eastern face. Not only that, but there are cut marks on it down here of unknown date, which could be blade cuts, which has parallels with Irish and Scottish um, sculpture, which seems to have been suggesting some kind of blade ritual associated with inauguration or other kinds of ritual practices sometime in this cross's use. We don't know when that happened because this has been standing since the 10th or 11th century. So what I would suggest is that perhaps these monuments, and this is another interesting muster location, I would suggest, um, very interesting landscape location, which I can't go into here, but bear, just believe me when I say that this is perhaps a, an assembly site, and indeed David Griffith has already got into print saying that too, um, and maybe we're seeing weapon depiction rather than weapon deposition in this case, four centuries later, or three and a half centuries later, being used in the landscape to articulate control of land and movement through the landscape. So I'm not giving you any simple answers, but I am going to leave you with a thought on this. We don't know if this was a clandestine deposition or a public deposition. We don't know if this was a place that was nowhere or somewhere. Right? So that doesn't narrow down much for you, does it? But I think we have to think beyond the ritual versus um, sort of uh, concealed loot frameworks that we've been presented with. And that's what I was asked to do, to think further about that. And I think we have to think about the relationships between these four. So what I'm suggesting here is you could have a very significant clandestine deposit that people know was deposited somewhere where no one knows it. They know that they've gone out somewhere and they've deposited it away. And that could have a very important mnemonic in itself. We've taken this stuff out of circulation, we're not going to tell you where, but it's out there. So it could be clandestine, but that could be clandestine in one sense, but also public in another sense. So you can publicly bury something where no one knows where it is, or you can secretly bury something where everyone knows roughly the zone in which you're burying it. And you can also have the usual ones we're thinking of, of a concealed place nowhere and a public place 
that's famed and remembered. So I'm putting that out there to say it's going to suggest that A, it's a lot more complicated than perhaps we're thinking about, and perhaps we should be thinking in a sort of network of mnemonics here, rather than simply as a ritual deposit or a concealed <coughs> secret deposit. Thank you very much.